I'm Tim Deegan. I'm the author of Make Fire, the art and science of working with propane. I like to make fire art. I like to work with fire as a tool too. I like to watch fire while I'm sitting around a campfire. I like to cook. I like pretty much everything to do with fire. Make Fire is a book designed to help you safely build propane flame effects, which are the things you might see at Burning Man or festivals or concert stages where they have big giant fireballs. It's absolutely essential to do it safely, and it can be done by pretty much anybody with the basic tools and basic understanding you'll get from reading Make Fire, the Art and Science of Working of Propane. However, fire as a beautiful thing doesn't really inform us of what's going on to make that beauty or that utility or that heat. And I've always been really interested in the fundamentals of things. I mean, what really causes the heat? What really causes the light? Why does fire look the way it does? So I wanted to put together some information to share about how fire actually happens. What's going on at the molecular level so that you can understand fire and enjoy it more and maybe do more with it. So if we want to describe fire, we might call it, you know, beautiful, useful, hot, dangerous. But that doesn't tell us, you know, what is fire? I mean, what is it exactly? Well, to use the appropriate technical term, we're talking about combustion when we talk about fire. And you may remember from school when they talked about the three legs of the combustion triangle. You have to have fuel, you have to have oxygen, and you have to have heat. If you have all three of those, you can have combustion. Uh, if you have all three of those, it's difficult to avoid combustion. If you take any one away, the way firefighters do, you can stop combustion. But when all three are present, you can get fire. And that still really doesn't tell us what fire is. So, mm, let's go deeper. Let's start with the fuel. So when we talk about fuel and combustion, we're really talking about vaporized fuel. When you see the smoke coming off a candle that you blow out, that's actually going on the whole time the candle is burning. That's the vaporized fuel. The solid wax, which is the fuel in solid form, isn't burning. It melts and vaporizes. It boils. And that's what's combining with the oxygen in our triangle to create heat. It gets sparked by the heat and it creates heat. So vaporized fuel allows those molecules to float freely and have lots of interactions. And that's really critical. Um, to understand what the fuel is, which really matters and what we want to do to understand what fire is, we should take a look at what candle wax and other fuels really are about. Not all fuels are what we call an alkane, that is a chain of carbons with a bunch of hydrogens, a hydrocarbon. But candle wax is full of a bunch of these long chain hydrocarbons, these long chain alkanes like hentriacontane. You can see these yellowed carbon atoms with their blue adorned hydrogen atoms hanging on. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, these can be super long. The longer they are, the higher their boiling point. That's why wax is a solid at room temperature. If you get it warm enough, it'll start to get soft and get melty. Um, and if you get it hot enough, it boils and vaporizes, you can burn it. Um, but every carbon you remove or add in this chain just changes the molecule. If you start with one carbon and four hydrogens, you have methane. And then you can start adding on past that. Butane, propane, hexane, you know, it goes on and on and on. There's a whole chain. There's a name for every one of these. Um, luckily, we don't find ourselves having to talk about hentriacontane too often, but we do talk about my favorite fuel for a variety of reasons, propane. Propane is three carbon atoms and eight hydrogen atoms. Uh, propane is a byproduct of gasoline production. Propane is a gas at anything above 40, negative 43.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which is negative 42 degrees Celsius, unless it's under a lot of pressure. If you've pressurized it into a barbecue cylinder or a giant, you know, um, multi-hundred gallon home propane tank, it stays under pressure. 
and it allows itself to be liquid at a higher temperature. We'll have another video sometime about the relationship between pressure, temperature, boiling point, and all these things. That's a whole fascinating topic, but we don't need to understand that to understand fire. So we've got the fuel. We've got these carbons with hydrogens, these hydrocarbon fuels like propane or hendriocontane or butane. Um, we have to add something else. We've got to plus in some oxygen. Okay, uh, the oxygen typically does not, oxygen is so reactive, it just doesn't float around as single oxygen atoms. It, it's got to combine with something or it gets all weirded out. So it combines with itself if you can't find anything else to react with and makes what they call O2. And you, you know, if you're watching any medical show, they're like, get some O2 in here. It's because that's the molecular form of free oxygen we get. So when we want to combine in our triangle of fire the propane and the oxygen, if we want to do a perfect burn, not too rich, meaning too much fuel in relationship to oxygen, or not too lean, meaning not enough fuel in relationship to oxygen, we need to have five oxygen atoms for each propane molecule, five oxygen molecules for each propane molecule. And if we achieve that, we get what's known as, and it's just fun saying it, a stoichiometric burn. Who doesn't like to say stoichiometric? And all, all that means is that the byproducts of what we're producing in this flame are restricted to water and carbon dioxide. You know, if you've got oxygen and you've got carbon and you've got hydrogen, you can make a lot of things. I mean, an awful lot of what's around us in the world is made of those three things. Um, you can make carbon monoxide. You can make free carbon. Um, you can make a variety of different things. But if you make a stoichiometric, a perfect burn, not too rich, not too lean, um, you will only produce water and CO2. Um, now, the third leg of our triangle is heat. Because without heat, you can have oxygen and propane, oxygen and methane. You can have oxygen and fuel together, and you know typically nothing will happen. I mean, there are circumstances under which you can make it happen, but all of them are either adding heat in some way or uh, providing the equivalent of heat, um, which is energy to the system. Um, what the heat does in this circumstance is it adds energy which breaks the molecular bonds in the propane molecule and the O2 molecules. And so we get these atoms floating around by themselves in this vapor, um, which is not a state they're particularly happy with. I mean, they have all kinds of electrostatic forces and other forces that make them want to be in combination. Um, it's very difficult to just have pure single atomic oxygen or hydrogen out there. They want to get together with other things. The molecule that is the fuel, the propane or the hendriocontane or whatever, I mean, it took energy to get that to stick together. Typically, like with the fossil fuels, um, it took a lot of time and a lot of pressure underground to get those to stick together. Um, you add additional energy and it'll break it apart, but that was a high energy produced. There was energy stored in that molecule by the energy it took to get it to stick together. And once it's all broken apart and it comes back together again in a more stable, lower energy molecule like water or CO2, it actually releases that stored energy. And what that does, that released stored energy, well, that, that H2O and carbon dioxide is left over that ends up releasing heat. And that heat, because our initially it might have just been a spark. We might have started a fire with a tiny little point source of heat. But then the combustion, that, that breaking apart of the molecules and recombining them into a simpler, releasing more heat, starts a chain reaction. And so the rest of the fuel and the rest of the oxygen gets caught up. And that's why you see a fire you know, explode out or roar out, um, you know, it, it's combustion can form a chain reaction to burn all the fuel and do all the uh, combining with oxygen and making the byproducts of things uh, until the fuel mix or the available oxygen or some leg of the triangle is broken. Well, so there we go. That's fire, right? Well, you know, 
I still got some questions because that doesn't really tell me what's going on. So if you start opening up a, a chemistry textbook and want to understand what fire is, they'll refer to it as a rapid reduction oxidation. They use the term redox reaction. Redox reactions are all over life. I mean, they're all over the world. I mean, rust is a redox reaction. It's, it's really like slow fire. I mean, there's lots of these redox reactions going on. The oxygen is being reduced, it's being broken apart um, down and combines with the hydrogen. Um, the propane is becoming oxidized, it's breaking apart and gaining some oxygen, it's becoming CO2. So reduction and oxidation goes hand in hand. Um, nothing lost. We're not, we're not losing any atoms. We're not gaining any atoms. We had heat in the system, but some of it was stored in those, in that propane molecule. Um, and so even though it's putting out a lot of heat, that's all heat that was originally stored. So, you know, thanks to the laws of thermodynamics, we know nothing's lost, nothing gained. It's just transformed from one state to another. Okay, that's cool. That's great. We understand fire now. So where does the light come from? This is one of the things that just drove me crazy for a long time. Where does the light come from? I mean, really, what's happening that makes fire so beautiful? Where do the colors come from? Why does a flame look like a flame? Well, that's when we talk about real life instead of our perfect world. Because the perfect world's easy to talk about, but it's very difficult to implement. Um, the reality is that most fire that we look at with flames the fuel oxygen ratio isn't perfect. There's either not enough oxygen or too much oxygen. So it's a little rich or it's a little lean, even if it's still burning. And propane's interesting in that, you know, as an example, all fuels have what they call a, a range of flame flammability. Um, if it's too rich, it won't burn. If it's too lean, it won't burn. For propane, it's got to be at least 2% in relationship uh, to air and no more than 10%. If, if it's outside of that on either side, it simply won't burn. And that's why you can light your barbecue propane grill and the flame doesn't roar back down the tube and explode the tank. I mean, everybody's frankly worried about that. I get that question a lot with people. How come, you know, do I need to put what's called a flash arrestor, uh, which is required in some systems to keep the flame head front from traveling back down the propane hose? And the reality is, no, you don't. Because the mixture of propane that's in that hose and in that cylinder, there simply isn't enough oxygen for it to burn at all. I mean, propane's pretty safe, except for the fact that, you know, you freeze your urns and die. You could drink the liquid. I mean, it's it's non-toxic. Um, it's, it's threats to you are all really just mechanical. I mean, it expands into a lot of gas, um, sometimes fairly violently if, if just opened up. Um, it burns, but the reality is that um, if you're outside that limits of flammability, you don't get uh, a, a fire. If you're inside the limits of flammability, you can get a couple of different experiences of fire. Uh, in the case where there aren't enough oxygen atoms, you still get some combustion, but you get some carbon left over in the, in the, in the redox reaction. And that carbon, that, that molecular carbon that's left over, uh, the other word for that is soot. And, and we've all seen it. I mean, you put a pan on a campfire and it comes away black, you know. Uh, I build a lot of flame effects. And, you know, this is a, a, an igniter I have for my flame effects. And it always comes back from everything, you know, coated in, in this black uh, gunk, um, which usually is pretty frustrating to me. But the reality of the situation is that without that black gunk, it'd be no fun at all. Because that carbon, which isn't burning, I mean, it's just floating in the vapor, is still heating up from all the heat around it. it it's heating up, it's vibrating, because heat at the most basic level is motion. And as it vibrates, it vibrates faster and faster, and it gets hotter and hotter. And once it gets hot enough, it starts emitting frequencies. It emits frequencies up to and including light. And so the carbon atoms that are floating free start to glow. So that, that beautiful flame that we see with yellow or red or orange or even white light, that's the carbon responding to the heat from the rest of the reaction. And that's called incandescence. 
the technical term is thermal or black body radiation from molecular motion. Remember, heat is, is that motion of those, those carbon atoms. They're moving so fast, they just get all worked up and they heat up and they start emitting light from that incandescence, that heat. And it's interesting because the reality is that it doesn't matter whether you're talking iron or carbon or titanium or whatever. Everything that's at the same temperature emits the same color. And this is an interesting tool. It's used by potters. It's used by metal casters. It's used by a, a, a lot of industries um, to be able to tell what temperature something is. Because it doesn't matter what the mixture of things is. The color will tell you the temperature that you're at. If you see that nice cherry red glow in a piece of metal, you know it's at 900 degrees. And that helps you uh, understand you know, when it's going to melt or what it can be alloyed with. Um, in the beautiful experience of fire, you know, when you're making light with fire, you get reds and oranges and whites and yellows because the carbon is at different temperatures at different places in the combustion process or, or area. And, and typically, you know, if, if you're making fire art and you're shooting big clouds of propane in the sky and igniting them, which, you know, boy, when I say it that way, it kind of sounds dangerous. But, and it is, you have to be safe. It's, but it's beautiful to watch, of course. Um, the flame is usually only around the outer edges of that cloud. It burns its way in as oxygen mixed. Because as the propane comes out, it's too rich. There's too much propane. Um, it's very difficult to ignite propane in some cases. Unless, you know, if you don't get enough oxygen, you can't ignite it at all. Uh, when it's moving very rapidly out of the end of a, a vent tube, um, a lot of times, you'll if you look very closely at fire art or watch videos of it, um, it's not burning right at the vent tube. It's burning about like eight inches or two feet away from it when it slows down enough to have turbulence and mix in some oxygen. Uh, but that light, that you're making the light, is a gift the carbon provides us. And so, without you know that that non-stoichiometric burn, that 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 rich burn that we're seeing here, we wouldn't get all the things we love about campfires and and poi and fire art and things like that. So the soot might be messy, but it's also, you know, what's making the light for us and is super beautiful. Well, most of the light. There is some light that comes from fire that isn't from the, the thermal black body radiation, the incandescence of the carbon. If you take a Bunsen burner, and you adjust the amount of air, which is really oxygen is what matters there, that's being put into the mix, you, you start out with what looks like a standard incandescent flame, the one you know far to the left. But as you adjust it, you start to take all the colors out except blue. And that blue light is light from excited molecular radicals, which is just an awesome band name, the Excited Molecular Radicals. I mean, I'm in. I'm in for anything called Excited Molecular Radicals, but what are they? I mean, what are Excited Molecular Radicals? Because they're contributing to what is fire, so we need to spend a moment and find out. So, a radical is a term for a molecule with at least one unpaired electron. And, you know, they form very briefly. They're not a particularly happy state for a molecule to be in, but, you know, there's a lot going on uh, as all that energy is pumped into a system. And for brief periods, you get these molecules with unpaired electrons. Now, an excited radical, which is what I would want to be, uh, basically means that you know, we see on the left a normal hydroxyl radical. Hydroxyl means it's 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 an oxygen hydrogen combo, and electrons they live in shells around a nucleus, um, and the electron shells represent different levels of energy that those electrons are at. And there's a pretty stable configuration for every atom of where its electrons are, but if you excite um, a radical, uh, that electron gets, that was in like an inner ring, gets pushed out, as you see in the right, to an outer ring. I mean, it's like, hey, I'm here, look at me, oh, this is exciting, but it's too much for it. It really can't handle that kind of experience. And so, despite its enthusiasm and energy in getting to that outer ring, 
it's going to get exhausted and it's going to fall back. It's going to fall back to the ring where it's supposed to be and the energy that got it to the outer ring, remember, nothing really gained, nothing really lost, just transformed, is shot out as a photon. Photon? Light. I mean, photons can be in a variety of frequencies. They might not be in the visible frequency. But in this case, we know that we can measure very exactly the change in energy between those energy levels, those shells, and we use what's called spectral line emissions to measure them, which means we can tell what color we should be getting. And when we measure it, we see that the swan bands, the areas that are generated from those transmissions, show up as blue wavelengths, which means we get blue, or mostly blue, spectral line emissions, which is why some fire looks like this. When you put your pot on a gas stove, you don't want it covered in soot. Um, you really want to just heat it up and not have to, you know, scrub all that black stuff off the bottom. So you want to get, they're balanced with enough oxygen inserted into the fuel mixture as it's going towards the burner head to create a stoichiometric burn. This is one of the areas where we do encounter stoichiometric burns on, on a daily basis if you have a gas stove. And the blue flame that you see really shouldn't have any yellow or orange uh, in it. If it does, it means that the burner is not working the way it's intended to and that's where you're going to get the the dirty soot uh, on your pots and you know it's a shame because you're not getting to enjoy it out in you know beautiful flames anyway so you want to make sure your your any gas appliance is working appropriately and operating with a stoichiometric burn if you know we go and use uh, most tools that are designed to uh, provide fire in your shop or someplace else it's a blue flame you know, it's a flame that's designed with the oxygen intakes. It's in training air. The fuel comes in, it shoots across it, it's got air mixing into it, so it can make a stoichiometric clean burn, which burns blue. So fire is not just red or yellow or orange. Fire, you know, can also be blue from excited molecular radicals. So this is why some fire looks like this, but some fire looks like this. I really hope that you've enjoyed this presentation. I hope it's been useful in understanding a little bit more about what goes on with fire. I always encourage everybody to dig in a little bit and understand the fundamentals because you never know when some, you know, subtle aspect of what you learned about the, the pure knowledge underlying it helps you do something more interesting. Um, I've received questions in this presentation before about how do people get colored flames? Um, I will tell you that in almost every case, if you're seeing a color other than that pure stoichiometric blue or the yellows, oranges, and reds that you normally see in fire, it's what's called an adulterant. It's a chemical that's being added, a salt or a metal or something that's being inserted into the fuel so that it burns with a different color. It's providing, you know, different uh, outputs because of the other atoms that are in, in copper or sulfur or something else that's being mixed in with it. Um, ask questions if you like. Leave questions for me. Um, I'm happy to answer and we can do more videos if people want to learn more about making fire, uh, doing it safely, or the fire itself. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoy making fire.